Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about graphs. Now, I don't mean the type of graphs that we talked about in algebra or calculus classes like that. I'm more talking about the graphs that you saw in classes like CSC 202. So graphs that have vertices and edges, things like that. So I'm going to actually go into a mathematical definition of what a graph is. So though you have seen these types of graphs before in 202, I'm actually going to run through the mathematical definition of these graphs. So a graph is a pair of two sets, V, which is a set of all vertices in the graph, and E, which is a set of all edges in the graph. So really what we're saying is that a graph is defined by the vertices that it has and the edges that connect the two vertices. So what I've done here is I've gone back up to our example. I've labeled all of the vertices V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5. And I've illustrated what the set V is for our graph. V equals V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5 all collected together in a set. Now, as for our edge set, we want to include all the edges in the graph. And the way that we write out edges is by listing the vertices that they connect. So the edges in this graph are v1, v2, v1, v2. Now, you might notice that there are actually two edges in this graph here that connect v1 and v2. And that's actually totally OK for us to have. And in the last video, I know I talked about ignoring duplicate elements, but really this v1, v2 and this v1, v2 are referring to slightly different edges in this case. So we're going to leave it like this for the time being. Then there's also v2, v3, v3, v4, v3, v5, v5, v4, and v5, v5. This v5, v5 refers to this little self loop right there. Now, there isn't really any special ordering to these edges in this particular graph. In this case, we have v5, v4, but this could easily be replaced with v4, v5. Because right now, when we're talking about edges here, there's no direction to these edges. So you can think about standing on v sub 1 here. And if I wanted to walk along one of those edges to v sub 2, I could take this edge like this, and I could take the same edge back from v sub 2 to v sub 1. So these edges, you can really travel any way you want on them. There's no specific direction that you have to take. So now what I've done is I've drawn up the same graph again, but this time I put arrowheads on the edges. And now we say that this graph is directed whereas this graph up here is an undirected graph. So in the directed version, we can write out the vertex set and the edge set as before. So our vertex set here has remained unchanged, but now the edge set is going to be a little bit tricky. So when we have directed edges like this, we actually want to very carefully define our edges based on the vertex that we start at and the vertex that we end at if we take this edge. So for example, if we start in vertex v1 and take this edge to vertex v2, we're going to represent this edge by first writing v sub 1 and then writing v sub 2 in this sort of ordered pair notation. If we then want to talk about going from v2 to v1 on this edge, and note that we have to take this edge in particular because we're not allowed to take this edge backwards. So in that case, that second edge is going to be from v sub 2 to v sub 1. Then we have the edge v sub 2 to v sub 3, the edge v sub 3 to v sub 4, the edge v sub 3 to v sub 5, and v sub 4 to v sub 5, and finally v sub 5 to v sub 5. So what we have here is that we've defined a graph as being comprised of two sets, a set of vertices and a set of edges. We've talked about how to write out the vertex set and edge set for a specific graph. We've actually talked about how 
Specifically, we're going to define a certain edge between two vertices. And we've shown how to do that specifically when we have directed graphs as well. So we can actually start classifying different types of graphs. So we can say that if we're given a graph G with vertex set V and edge set E, we can call G a simple graph if for every pair of vertices U and V, there is at most one edge UV, and for every vertex U, there is no edge U, U. So in other words, we're not gonna have any sort of duplicate lines between any pair of vertices, and we're not gonna have any loops going from one vertex to itself. So we can take this graph as an example, and we can note that there are two edges going between V1 and V2. So because of this, this graph is not simple. However, if we look at this directed version of the same graph, now we have an edge from V1 to V2 and an edge from V2 to V1. And these edges are actually going to count as different edges because one goes from V2 to V1 and the other goes from V1 to V2. So in this case, this graph is in fact simple. Here's yet another example of a graph. Now, this one doesn't have any duplicate edges between any two vertices, which is good, but we have this loop here connecting V1 to itself. So this graph cannot, in fact, be simple. But if we were to get rid of that loop, all of a sudden, this becomes a simple graph. So I want to say that graph theory, or the study of graphs, is actually probably my favorite subject in all of computer science and math that I've taken at Cal Poly. And I just, I really enjoy it. My whole master's thesis is in graph theory. Graph theory is actually, it was my favorite subject when I took this class. And it's pretty much what propelled me into grad school. Pretty much all by itself was a uh, very quick introduction to graph theory. So I really enjoy it a lot. And part of the reason why I enjoy it is because graphs end up being a really astonishingly simple way to represent complex relationships between objects. So in computer science, we often use graphs when we're talking about the relationships between objects. Now, something you might remember from 202 is using graphs to talk about road networks. So, by the way, when I talk about a certain type of real life graph, I'm going to talk about it by defining what the vertices are in that graph and what an edge between two vertices represents. So when we talk about graphs representing roads, we are usually talking about a road network, which is a graph where vertices represent specifically intersections between two roads or dead ends in roads. And an edge exists between two vertices if those two intersections are connected to each other. Basically, if the two intersections represented by those vertices are connected with a road segment, then there's an edge between those two vertices. So for an example, using San Luis Obispo geography, you can represent California Street going down this way, and you have Foothill kind of coming around like this and shooting off that way. And then this way you have Santa Rosa or Highway 1 intersecting with Foothill and coming down like this. And then Santa Rosa has smaller intersections with a bunch of roads like Maneki, Murray, all a whole bunch of ones down here. Eventually, you have this whole place where Santa Rosa crosses Highway 101. And you have these little exits and entrances from Highway 101 onto Santa Rosa like this. And from Santa Rosa onto Highway 101. So what we have here is Highway 101 doesn't actually intersect with Santa Rosa. And instead, Santa Rosa passes directly over Highway 101, so there's no, uh, there's no vertex connecting Santa Rosa and Highway 101. Rather, we have these vertices here where we have the highway exits and such. So this is an example of a road network. And back in 202, you would have used Dijkstra's algorithms to figure out, okay, well, what's the shortest distance between, say, California and Highway 101? Now, of course, this is a super, super small subsection of that road network graph. Of course, 
foothill goes way out over here. You have Choro, you have Broad, all kinds of stuff out there. California goes all the way down here with all its intersections, and eventually that intersects with 101, and so on. So you can probably imagine that once we start including more and more and more roads, it starts to become a more and more complicated graph, which it is. There's a lot of research on road networks and trying to find uh, different shortest path uh, programs or different uh, traffic flow programs that we can use to analyze roads, basically. But road networks are a such a fantastic example of real life applications of this very theoretical mathematical field. So there's another type of really commonly used graph, and unfortunately it's extremely relevant in terms of the state of the world right now. It's called an infection network. So it's a graph where vertices represent people, and an edge exists between two vertices if the people they represent have had contact in a way that can transmit disease. Now an infection network is actually going to be specific to each type of disease that it represents. So we can maybe look at the infection network for measles. So let's build a small population of people like this. It's relatively small. And we can start adding edges in a way that would be sort of what we would expect for measles transmission. Now, something that's really interesting is that humans tend to form pretty closely connected social circles. So there's a chance that if you know two people, there's a pretty good chance that they're likely to know each other as well. So we can try drawing edges in between some of these people like this. So right here, we have a pretty close cluster of people. And then maybe these couple of people know these people like this. So another pretty close cluster. You have this person right here who's a social butterfly. Not a good thing when we're talking about uh, disease transmission. I'm drawing these sort of semi-randomly here. Uh, and an interesting pattern when we're talking about graphs of people is that you happen to see a lot of triangles. So maybe we have a population like this and we want to see, okay, well, these people have all had contact in a way that could possibly spread measles through a population. So now let's say this person in this subset of the population is the initial person infected with measles. Now, what we're actually going to draw is something called a transmission tree, which is a special type of graph that actually shows the direction that a disease progresses in a population. So in this infection network right here, just because these people have had a contact that could say, in this case, spread measles, doesn't necessarily mean that measles will travel between these two. So let's say this person initially has measles and spreads it to this person, but they haven't spread it to this person at all because let's say they had that type of contact before our initial subject got measles. And now we can say, well, let's say the measles jumps down here like this. But let's say these people are pretty well isolated because, you know, they don't really have big community structures. So it's not like the measles is really going to go anywhere. Maybe they start feeling sick and quarantine themselves away, as you should when you feel sick. But then let's say that the measles jumps to this person who is at the center of a huge social circle. And all of a sudden... Measles starts getting passed to a whole bunch of people. And let's say that it's taken this long, it passes to this many people before this person finally realizes, oh, well, I don't feel so good, so maybe I should uh, stop going outside. And then let's say the spread continues like this. And at this point, We've run out of places that the measles can go, so we can stop here. And let's say that this person got this person at the very bottom got lucky enough that they don't get they don't get affected by measles at all. So they're perfectly healthy somehow. So basically, what we have is in blue, we have the actual transmission of measles. We have a directed graph that shows okay, who's the initial case? Basically, the person who doesn't have an arrow pointing 
towards them, but only has arrows pointing out. And then we can see, okay, now we can look at, now we can track how the virus has spread. So, oh, there's a lot of research going into this right now. Some of the big diseases that are being studied are measles, HIV, and certainly COVID is going to be studied with a lot of methods like these. Now, we can't necessarily determine, I would imagine, a uh, perfect infection graph yet for COVID, just because we don't know the exact ways that it can be transmitted. But once we have these models of how COVID can be transmitted, it's actually really useful for doing stuff like simulating how disease passes through population. Um, those of you who know Super Chris, uh, Christopher Sue in the department, he's a professor right now. But back when he was a master's student here, he actually did simulations on how we can best isolate people from the spread of a pandemic. So he was actually able to use graph theoretical models like these to make some really useful uh, conclusions about how to effectively lock, uh, prevent pandemics and lock down people if a pandemic happens anyway. All using graph theory. So graph theory is, in short, a really powerful tool. And honestly, it's a lot of fun to work with. So I really enjoy it. Um, I'll probably be talking about graph theory a bit as we go through the quarter, just because I really enjoy it. Uh, just an aside on my thesis, because it is also heavily graph theory related. I'm working on power networks. So the network of machinery that gets electricity from the, all the power stations to your home. And I'm actually am fortunate enough to be working with a rather large grid in the United States. Now, normally it's really hard for people to get grids of, or to get graphs of electrical grids, seeing that it's very sensitive information. So I got, I really lucked out being able to work with that kind of real life data. But right now I'm working on simulating things like, okay, well, if there's a problem in the graph, how can we redirect power without overloading the system and that kind of stuff? I want to build a simulation that can hopefully handle all of that kind of stuff. So graph theory, if you're looking for something where you can do a lot of good with your knowledge. Graph theory is a really good way to learn something super mathy and computer science -y and all that that actually has a lot of really cool applications in real life. And a lot of people are super interested in graph theory. Social networks are all about graph theory. Social networks help decide, okay, well, who's friends with who or who's following who? And that lets you find out some really cool things about a community. Uh, sometimes really creepy things, too, if you're on the scale of what Facebook's doing with trying to figure out, oh, well, all these people like this kind of thing, so this person must like this kind of thing, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, graph theory is a lot of fun. I'm excited to talk about it more this quarter. I hope that I actually get people interested in graph theory because there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with it. And if anyone has any questions about graph theory stuff, or really about any of the material in this class, honestly, feel free to shoot me an email or talk to me in office hours. I'm more than happy to go off about all the cool math stuff that I've learned and how you all can best uh, supplement your computer science education with a good, healthy dose of math. All right, well, I kind of went off track a little bit at the end of this video, but that's our introduction to graphs. And the next thing we're going to start talking about is propositions which are the very basic structures that allow us to work with logic in our math.